Hi, this is Guy Wallace. I'm sitting on the back side of my property in the woods with the pond, of my neighbor's pond in the background, and I thought I'd spend a little bit of time here talking about uh, creating a series to discuss my experiences in the training and development world, the performance-based training and development world, also known as learning and development. It all started for me I was working in Lawrence, Kansas at the site gas station. Uh, the uh, fall semester had started. I had spent the summer working the night shift from midnight till 9 a.m. The entire summer, ruining a summer in college, who would have thought. And uh, I went in one day and they had cut my hours. The hours that I was expecting that I actually needed to help fund my way through college. I had the GI Bill as well, but I was funding my way through college, paying for it all myself, trying to minimize my student loans. And I went in one day to check out the schedule and they had cut my hours back to something like four hours. Well, <clears throat> I got angry and I didn't quit right then, but I went to the unemployment office in Lawrence, Kansas and explained to the people behind the desk you know what was going on and they said oh well here's a job opportunity for you they're looking for a veteran even so why don't you go check this out so i went to our local wicks lumber center kind of like lowe's or home depot for those of you in the u.s but uh, building materials supplier uh, for consumers do-it-yourselfers and for building contractors so I went there and I interviewed with the uh, manager who liked me and hired me on the spot. And so I, on my way home, I drew, swung by the old site gas station and told the manager that I quit. And he was upset because I've left him in the lurch or something, you know, which was ridiculous. But uh, also at the time I was uh, doing uh, work on campus in between classes. Besides studying, I had a job on campus. So. Um, but I started at Wix Lumber as an inside salesperson and I started on a Saturday and anybody who knows anything about those kinds of businesses that's the busiest day of the week we weren't open on Sundays but Saturday was our busiest day so they uh, showed me the uh, catalog uh, so I could uh, find the prices for products uh, that weren't marked, you know, two by fours and sheets of plywood and paneling. They're not all individually marked, but so I could look them up in the price catalog and fill out a sales order, and then the customer would take that to the cashier up front and then go around the back and pick up all their stuff. And but anyway, so I'm dealing with my first customer, and there are seven of us behind the sales counter. Me, the do guy. Uh, all the other salespeople, the part-timers, the full-timers, we all worked on Saturdays. The assistant manager was behind the counter, and the manager was behind the counter taking orders, so seven of us. So I look up while I'm writing out the first sales order that I've got, and uh, there's a line behind my customer, seven deep. So seven times seven, 49 people waiting for all of us to write out these orders and so they could pay for it and go pick up their their goods <clears throat> so I was trained by asking Al the old guy uh, Albert I was soon to become Guy Bert uh, but Albert uh, Al uh, was the one who would tell me where to look what the what the first three numbers of the price code were for plywood it was whatever I can't remember now that was a long time ago 19 uh, 76 is when this happened and uh, I so I learned by Al and I had to ask him and I had to interrupt his sales to ask my questions so that I could deal with my customers and that's a steep learning curve and not the easiest way to learn all of that uh, the company offered training they were the 35 millimeter slide strips with audio tracks and uh, we would go back into the break room and uh, uh, take the training courses and things like that and every Saturday morning before the busiest day of the week we would spend one hour from seven o'clock till eight o'clock in the morning uh, having a management meeting where the managers were theoretically training us or telling us what was important what was coming up and all of that uh, but anyway so that's how I I learned to, to do the sales job on campus and I owed Al everything 
uh, I began to excel at the inside sales jobs. In fact, when they'd hold the sales contests and there'd be spiffs, you'd get little rewards if you sold X amount of cat kitchen cabinets and things like that, or paneling or whatever the special was that they were focusing on. I did real well at that. In fact, I won most of the sales contests after I'd been there about six months. Uh, not everybody was pleased with that. The full-time salespeople that were there working 40, 48 hours a week uh, were being beaten out by this kid who was working 24 to 32 hours a week. Um, but I did real well at that. And, uh, and, and I worked for three different managers over the two and a half years I was there at the Lawrence, Kansas uh, store center. And uh, um, the third manager uh, had this big contest that he was entering our store into. It was something for all the managers. Now, there were either 183 or 283 stores across the country. I can't remember again. It was a long time ago. And uh, he wanted to win a $10,000 remodeling of the store. And to do that, we had to build a bathroom vanity display with the you know cabinet and the sinks and the uh, faucets and the mirrors and cabinets and all those kinds of things and we had to set up a row of these things and uh, he put me in charge of that and uh, because he had to do this contest and he had to take something showing the rest of the managers in the system you know what he was uh, what he had done at his store and uh, uh, so I had a friend who was a photographer who had uh, friends who were kind of like fashion models. And so my friend, after the store was closed, late at night, nobody knew that we were doing this. The manager kind of knew I was going to do something, but he didn't know exactly. I had my friend Tim Gunn come in and uh, do the photography. And he brought in this uh, beautiful young woman who did the typical modeling kinds of things that you see in all kinds of advertisements. Well, we did a bunch of pictures. Uh, he gave me the film at the end of that. Um, I built a display board and I had to drive into Kansas City 45 minutes away and have them process the film and print out the pictures so that I could put it on this big display board. And uh, I did that that, the, the, that day, you know, this was like a 24, 36 hour thing in a row. I was working on this thing. And I got that all put together and drove it back to the store just in time to meet my manager who was headed to the local airport so that he could make the flight to Saginaw, Michigan or wherever they held the, their management conference, I'm not sure. Anyway, he won $10,000. And it happened to be at that management conference that the all the managers were told, okay, we're gonna go video with training. We're gonna get rid of these 35 millimeter slide projectors with audio tracks, and we're gonna go to video. And uh, we're gonna go with uh, VHS, not beta. Only the old people in the audience here know what the heck that was all about. And uh, we're going to give you uh, video players that wouldn't record and hopefully that would reduce shrink otherwise known as theft by employees or others uh, who wouldn't want to take this because all it would do is play it wouldn't record off of the television cable systems whatever and uh, so he won that but he told the, the vice president of human resources who had made the announcements of video that hey I've got this guy back in my store, Guy Wallace, who's getting a degree in radio TV film. He would be perfect for your job. He's won all these sales contests, blah, 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 blah. And unbeknownst to that manager, the two other managers that I had worked for also went up to the vice president of human resources and told him that they needed to hire Guy Wallace out in Lawrence, Kansas, because he's getting this radio TV film degree and all blah, blah, blah. So uh, the vice president of human resources knew that he wanted to hire me because I had come highly recommended from three managers who had some uh, respect across the system. And uh, we were the number one training site in out of all the stores. And now uh, there's a story behind that I'll share in a moment. But uh, anyway, so I got the call to go there 
it was six to nine months before I graduated, so this was really cool to have a job lined up before you gra actually graduated from college. So I was very happy about that. But what this entailed was that I had to fly from Lawrence, Kansas, to Kansas City, to Detroit, Michigan, to Saginaw, Michigan, got picked up by a guy named Roger Varney, who drove me to the first set of interviews. And I didn't know who Roger was or anything. Come to find out that he is the brother-in-law of Gary Rumler, who I didn't know from anybody at that particular point in time. Funny story on that is that uh, Roger stopped at the first stoplight leaving the airport, the Tri-City Airport in the Saginaw Bay City and uh, um, wherever Dow Chemical is. I can't remember the name of the town now. But um, so we stop at the stoplight. He says, okay, guy, I want you to do me a favor here. I want you to look at the traffic light there. And when it turns green, I want you to start counting. Count aloud, please, for me. And so I thought, oh, this is strange. So I, uh, <clears throat> I, the light turned green and I counted one, two, and somewhere between two and three, a car zoomed by in front of us. And I thought, ooh. And so Roger proceeded and we stopped at the next stoplight and he said, could you do that again for me? Count when the light turns green. And I did one, two, <sighs> the car goes through after two. And we did it the third time. And then after the third time, he said, Guy, I just wanted to uh, share with you that in Michigan, a green light means triple check before you pull forward because somebody's going to broadside you. So that was my introduction to Roger Varney and <laughs> life in Michigan on the road. Um, I went and had my interview with Roger because he was the one who was going to be in charge of the conversion from slide strips to video. And so he would have been my boss. So I interviewed with him and then I went and talked to the Vice President of Human Resources and he really liked me and uh, I didn't hear anything immediate and I went, you know, flew the trip back to Lawrence, Kansas and, and got called in and said, okay, uh, well, actually what I was told by the Vice President is that, okay, the, the director of the department isn't around, so I'd like you to come back next week I think it was on a Friday, and come back on a come back here and interview with him. And so I did that, um, and I uh, uh, did the interview with uh, with Charlie, who was going to be the my boss's boss eventually. And uh, he said, "Well, uh, Charlie said, okay, so I've got a new brand new manager coming in, but she won't be here until next Friday." Uh, that'll be her, her first uh, week on the job or something like that. We'd like you to come back a third time, three Fridays in a row, and interview for this job. And I thought, okay, so I made the trip all the way back to Lawrence, Kansas, and spent the week working and school and that, and flew back and met this woman. And, and she was bringing another person with her from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Detroit, Michigan, where she had she and Gail had worked for... Rick Rumler, the brother of Gary Rumler, and not to be confused with the son of Gary Rumler's, uh, Rick, but uh, so she was excited and I, you know, I had field experience. I'd actually been out there for two and a half years. I knew the sales thing that was going to be one of our key target audiences that we we're going to go after. So I got offered the job and I was, you know, very happy about it back in those days, 1979. Those of us with bachelor's degrees were hoping to get out and make $12,000 a year. And if I would have stayed and gotten my MBA, I would have made $18,000 a year. And these people offered me fourteen five, dollars Big deal. So I was very, very happy. If I'd gotten a job in regular old radio or TV or something like that, I'd have been making six grand a year. So this was, this made me happy. One of the lessons I learned from all of that and what I counsel people going through college is that, you know, before you choose your degree, your major, you need to know what the salary is out there because if I had only known that when I was starting off in radio, TV, film, that I was only going to make $6,000 a year if I got a job in that field. I remember being told in the journalism school at the University of Kansas that there's, you know, 125,000 of you with graduating this year and with this degree and there's, you know, 5,000 jobs or something like that. And so, you know, good luck. And I thought, oh, those are things I wish I'd known about. So I was very happy to have all this fall in my lap here and get this offer to go to Saginaw, Michigan. So I had to finish summer school. 
to finish my degree and then I drove off to Saginaw Mission and I began my career there. And one of the first things that they gave me was this book and they said, you need to read this book. And it was by Bob Mager and Peter Pipe and it was Analyzing Performance Problems or they really ought to wanna. And I was so pumped. I was gonna be joining a training organization. This was better than educational TV, which is I thought what I might wanna go into. Um, but I was, you know, kind of in the education training realm. I didn't know the difference between the two at the point at that point. But I but I read this book and I was so excited about this. I read this book the first night. I stayed up late, finished reading it. The next day I went in, I ordered four copies of this book and I sent copies of that book, Analyzing Performance Problems, to my four best friends from college. And this being 1979, they had to send me a letter in the US mail back and they basically said the equivalent of, what the hell is this crap all about? What's, what's wrong with you? Anyway, so they didn't get it, and I, but I was excited because I was gonna be doing something that was gonna improve people's performance, and if training wasn't part of the solution, we weren't gonna do that. We were gonna make recommendations on how to make other fixes. And I had spent three years in the Navy and two and a half years at Wix Lumber, and I knew that there were plenty of organizational problems that could be fixed by something maybe other than training. Um, and uh, so I, so I'd made that third trip. You know, uh, one of my one of my heroes at the time was the now the late Stanley Turrentine, a, a jazz artist, and uh, I had a concert lined up in Kansas City to go to. And uh, but wouldn't you know it? The way it often works is that on my return trip, my flight got delayed in Detroit. I got back to Kansas City really late. I got back to Lawrence, Kansas, even later, and. Um, the people that I was going to go to this concert with <laughs> left without me and went to this concert. And so, <clears throat> but it was all good because I had this really cool job lined up and I was going to learn about the methods and approaches to instructional design from Bob Mager. And then I got just a lot of materials from the late Tom Gilbert and the late Gary Rummler, they were alive at that point, but I got all these materials and one of the things was a three or four page mimeographed sheet about uh, what they called guidance, which later became job aids, which later became electronic performance support systems if embedded in software, or quick reference guides or kind of a mini SOP if you will. Now we're calling it performance support or workforce learning. But one of the things that we decided to do, or what, what I was taught, was when you're out there doing your analysis of the job tasks and the outputs, you need to always be thinking, could this be a job aid? And rather than creating training or teach people how to use the job aid in the training, is what we would do. Now, what I've discovered, what I discovered back then and what I've discovered since is that most of our clients are expecting training, what we nowadays call learning sometimes. I'm, I'm old school, so I, I call it training. Um, and that clients were not very happy with getting training, uh, uh, or excuse me, that got you know job aids or performance support. They were expecting training. And um, so we, we struggled with that, and rather than uh, die on that hill, because that's not the hill to die on, I learned, is that we would simply take the job aid and rather than distribute that out to the field and let people figure it out for themselves and apply it, because most of them would have been able to do that, we incorporated those things into our training courses that we were building. So we got the job aids out there, but you know, unnecessarily we you know, sandwiched it in between training content. And the training content that we were building there was very interesting. It was all video based. You know, video is going to save the world nowadays, here in 2020, and back in 1979, video was going to save the training world then as well. Uh, not so fast. Uh, we built uh, training, product knowledge training, basically for the sales force. Uh, because that was important. We were less worried about the people who loaded cars and trucks with uh, the goods in, in the backyard, uh, but it was what was happening in the sales force. And so we did these and we, we covered 
product knowledge. We covered DIY, do-it-yourself installation tips and tricks, you know, so that we could counsel our customers as they were deciding about the purchase. So we could talk about features and benefits. We could talk about how to install this. And the third part of our video, 15-minute videos, it was capped at 15 minutes, no longer, no less, basically, um, were how to sell the ancillary equipment, which was the high margin stuff, all the little nails and hammers and tools and all that stuff. That's where the big margin was. It wasn't in the plywood and paneling and all those kinds of things that were the, the bulk sales. Um, and uh, so those that was and then we had a leader's guide that would guide the assistant manager or the store manager in leading those sessions every Saturday morning the hour before the store opened and they would use these materials they would show the video and all that stuff well as soon as you know I helped shape all of that at the very beginning because I was involved in the production of the very first video based training program was I said you know what's gonna happen is that Salespeople are going to take their customer into the employee break room, set them down at a table, plug in this video, turn it on, and let the customer watch us because of the installation tips. So they learn about the features and benefits as well. They learn how to install this, which is what the customers were most concerned with. And then, so I said, when we get to this third part here and we're selling the ancillary stuff, we have to do soft sales because customers are going to see this. No kidding. And there was, you know, I remember having the big arguments with people. Oh no, we don't want you to do this. We need to really teach them how to sell this stuff. And I'm thinking, no, wrong mistake here. <laughs> Let's tone it down. Do subtle selling. Um, you know, hey, you don't want your customer to go home and discover that they don't have the right tools or the right nails or ancillary stuff that they need for this, this project that they've taken on. It's do the customer a benefit. So it was all about the benefit to the customers, how we posed it in the videos. And so that made it soft selling. We would nudge the customer. We would nudge the salespeople into doing the right thing and making the customer happy. Uh, and not screwing up their installation or not having to make two or three trips back to the store because no one likes that stuff. Um, that was a, it was a eye-opening experience doing that work, doing the sales thing. Again, I found I was very good at it at the store. I translated that back into how we approached selling uh, training the salespeople on the various products and that was the big thing. I remember we had a budget of $500 for every video that we produced. We could only hire um, one person, um, one talent as we called them, one professional talent, and then we would have our friends and family come in and we'd pay them you know, 25 bucks or something to spend a couple hours with us. And one of the things that that forced me to do in the, in the training arena is that you know, I produced uh, film projects, not video projects, but film projects in college. And one of the things that I really disliked about all of that is that when I had to go with my fellow students on their project and help them out, as they did with me, they wasted my time. They would waste, and I couldn't work uh, uh, with them on Saturdays because I worked at the Wick Slumber Store, but on my projects on Sunday, my only free day to study and goof off and have fun, like a college student, uh, was taken up with their projects. Things that should have taken two hours took eight, 10, 12 hours because they didn't have a clue, they weren't organized. And if there's anything that I knew about myself is that I'm organized. I will organize it. And I prided myself in college of being able to get people in and out of my video projects, my film projects, as quickly as possible and be done with it. And then spend all the rest of the time, you know, doing the editing, and etc. Well, when we're doing videos, so we had to do the same thing. So I had to learn how to set up the camera one time uh, in this spot, pointing this direction, and capture scenes 1, 5, 12, 27, 32, and 48. And then we turn the camera around and point it the other way, back at a different character, cast member, and get their scenes. And then, and then we had to do this before the sun went down because we had to shoot in the stores after hours, which meant, uh, you know, sometimes there was daylight out and sometimes there wasn't. And we had to be careful of daylight and our own lighting and mixing that. And, but we had to be most efficient with our time in the store and our time with the people and our time with the talent. 
the five hundred dollars that I forget what we paid the guy, but uh, it was one take. Tom, we love this guy because he could get it down one time. We'd shoot it, be done with it, and go on to the next thing and do the next scene and the next scene, etc. Um, that led to me. Uh, uh, and my role, this is funny, this is almost like being in the military. So I entered into into the training department and I was going to supposedly go for the video job, but they didn't want to hire me. So I ended up working for the course development side where I wrote the training materials, wrote the video scripts, and I worked with the video people to get the video produced. So I'd be out on the set when we're making the shots and everything. Well, at one point, the boss of that part of the department uh, got sick and took a leave of absence and so they moved me from course development over there to help out with the video thing but they wouldn't put anyone in charge so there was three of us who could have been in charge but you know so that was a mess and I think we were in the middle of one project where I said you know this is ridiculous so let's let's do this let's have each one of us take a turn at being the project leader and the other two people will work for that person that person can make all the decisions do all the planning and do things like that and uh, that way we'll all get this experience you know playing all the parts and uh, that didn't work out so well either because there was no process so um, so I had to go fix that. So I ended up creating a process that took us from the very beginning. What do we have to do? Get the scripts approved, do all that stuff, do the storyboarding, uh, and how to do the storyboarding. Here's a template, you know, call out the scene so we can go into the store, shoot this way, then go shoot that way, then go to some other part of the store, you know, set up the camera the minimum number of times because every time you set up a camera, you had to adjust for the white balance and the lighting and you had to move the lights around. And so it was a, just a you know, a big production, if you will, even for a little training department. So I created this process uh, for doing the video production process, and it, and so everybody started using it. Everybody liked it because it made their jobs easier. It was basically a series of job aids on how to be the project leader, which later or soon became known as "Oh, great project leader," because that's how we refer to each other when you know we knew that the other person was in charge. "Oh, great project leader, please approve this." "Oh, great project leader, here's my idea for this." And after 18 months at uh, Wix Lumber headquarters in Saginaw, Michigan, I, uh, my significant other was uh, getting a job in uh, Chicago, getting moved by the company. And uh, so I went to Chicago and ended up uh, working at Motorola. Um, and I think that one of the things that uh, impressed the people at Motorola is that I had created this process, this set of tools, um, that I was a devotee of Gary Rumler. And uh, when I had sent my resume into Motorola, um, the, the directors were changing and there was a new director coming in and there was a woman, Barbara Warbritton, who was opening the new guy's mail before he got there and deciding what to set aside for him to look at and, and what to throw away. And so she was doing this and she came across my resume, which was 16 page booklet, saddle stitched, done by the print department at Saginaw, Michigan at Wix because that guy loved me because I made his life easier because we I didn't make him do massive print runs and then find a mistake and we'd have to redo the whole darn thing. So he was, Carl was his name, he was very helpful to me in putting together this uh, 16 page resume, brochure booklet like. And, uh, but anyway, Barbara Warburton came across this, opened up the mail, saw this, and at the bottom of the first page it said, follower of the methodologies of Gary Rumler. And she said, Gary Rumler? Heck, we're having him come in speak to us. This new guy, Bill Wiggenhorn, is bringing in Gary Rumler to talk to us. I think Bill would be interested in seeing this resume. And so she set it aside for him. And long story short, I got the job. I asked for $22,000. I was making seventeen five dollars at the time. Motorola said, hmm, uh, we're going to offer you twenty five. dollars I found out later that I was making about ten grand less than everybody else in the department at the time. And even if they, even when they gave me ten, a 10% 10 increase, I did the math and figured out, I'm going to be here quite a while before I catch everybody. So I, I started to look for greener pastures. But uh, um, my time at Motorola was really, really cool. 
I actually came in a week before my official start date to see this Gary Rumler. Now I had met Gary Rumler in 1980 in April at the NSBI conference where I was introduced to him, but you know he wouldn't remember me from that. But anyway, I met him, saw all these other great people, Bob Mager, Joe Harless, uh, and really tons and tons of other people. Um, and if I start trying to list the names here, I won't, it won't be complete, so I'll just stick with those, those four names, Tom Gilbert included. Um, and then, but then I saw Gary Romer and I spent a day in a workshop, again, one week before my official start day. And this, this, this session, there's a 46 minute video I've posted that Gary allowed me to post of him from that day. And you see the back of my head in one shot, so you'd never recognize me, but, but the other people, you know, it's fun to go back and look at this because this was, you know, 1981. And, uh, um, so I, started the next week and that day Bill Wiggenhorn brought in this guy named Neil Rackham who was working on this sales methodology SPIN situation problem implications and needs payoff is what that SPIN acronym stands for it's a Socratic approach to selling it's asking questions of the customer and guiding them through their decision-making process as to whether or not what the salesperson has has enough benefit to them that it'll pay off a need and be worth the price so that the ROI would be more than sufficient enough to warrant making the purchase. So I got exposed to Gary Rumler and Neil Rackham and got to work with Neil Rackham uh, on some periphery stuff. Uh, but I got introduced to one of his colleagues back in uh, Sheffield, England, John Carlisle who was delivering win-win negotiations training using the same kinds of a structure, a model of communications behavior that was part of spin selling back in those days. I don't think it's that way any longer. But I worked. I went to Sheffield, England, uh, watched John deliver some of this negotiation training stuff. I thought it was really cool. Uh, I arranged for a pilot session for he and another guy to come in and deliver it to uh, purchasing agents and salespeople and government contract negotiators who all were involved in negotiations and so we were going to approach this in a win-win manner win for everybody or you know walk away and i got a chance to do that uh, one of the other people that bill wiggenhorn brought in to help orient his staff to a new way of thinking about all of this was a guy named ray svenson and ray svenson came in and talked about this thing called curriculum architecture and the story on this was that Ray had been part of the uh, part of AT&T. He was a Bell Labs engineer. He'd gone into uh, Bell Labs management, then went to AT&T management, was involved in strategic planning at the corporate level. Um, and then they sent him to one of their training centers for him to do strategic planning there. Uh, that, that training center addressed the needs of 50,000 engineers across the Bell system all across the United States, all the Bell operating companies state by state. Um, but he talked about this thing called curriculum architecture and it's a concept that came from the IT world, information technology, which had recently changed its name from MIS. And when they went from MIS, management information systems, to information technology, that bumped those of us who were instructional technologists off the map. So we couldn't use IT anymore because it meant something else. And so we instructional technologists became ideas, instructional designers, or ISDers, instructional systems developers, or instructional systems designers. The language has been a mess since I've been in the business. Um, but so Ray had talked about this thing called curriculum architecture, modularizing the content. You know, later on we started calling this thing chunking and all that stuff, but modularizing it so that people could get exactly what they needed as best as the deployment method, you know, would allow. If you're going to go to a class for five days, you're going to take everything. But so how can you configure the content and modularize it and package it that best fit the audience? So while some audience members would take things that they perhaps already knew, that would be of the minority of the cases. Otherwise, you would have culled that out and, and made that separate. Well, he talked about this curriculum architecture thing, and I really like that idea. And so I did one. I was given a job assignment to work 
for man on manufacturing supervisors across five different strategic business units making five different totally different kinds of products but these were manufacturing supervisors they generally were taken from the ranks of the production workers and made a supervisor and we needed to do we needed to provide them something and my clients 30 manufacturing operations managers mobs for short otherwise known as mother well never we won't go there but that's they were prideful of that they said we are the fart belch and scratch crowd and we don't care if these degreed engineers what they think about us we're the ones who actually make things happen here at Motorola but they were my clients 30 of them so we're talking about this thing that they had tagged the ABC's of supervision and that's what they wanted and they couldn't agree amongst them as to what this included what it excluded and what sequence we would do anything and so I said well you know I'm, I, I listened to them tell me about the, the project that they had envisioned and I was at one of their meetings when they were local there in the Chicagoland area and all 30 of them and I said you know well okay I hear you this is what you want I think I did my best at active listening laying out basically what I had heard which was a mess uh, of a request and I said okay this is what we're gonna do we're, you know we're gonna start off by doing analysis and blah blah and they stopped me and said guys stop it we hate analysis we really hate it when you guys from the training organization come back 90 days later and tell us what we told you on day one. We hate that. And so I said, okay, well, you know, this is what I'm going to go do. Here's the kinds of questions I'm going to ask of the supervisors out there. And I want to talk to your exemplar supervisors. And so they said, exemplars? What? What? Yeah, that sounds like a three dollar college word what the hell does that mean as so I explained it and they go we hate that word don't use that and I go how about master performers and they said yeah that that makes sense okay we'll go with that so I've been calling them exemplars Tom Gilbert's exemplars master performers since then you know go with the language of your customer don't force your stuff down their throat anyway so I went and I told them here's the kinds of things I'm gonna go for and maybe you can answer these questions for me right now well they couldn't because it had been a while, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years for some of them. The last time they were a supervisor and did the supervisor's job, so it became apparent to them, all 30 of them, that they didn't know the answers. They didn't really know the job at some detailed, nuanced level as to how it worked today. So, okay, we're going to let Guy go out and do this analysis. And so I laid out a plan with them right in front of their eyes on the flip chart easels. And I made sure, damn sure, that it was going to be less than 90 days. So I can't remember if it was 30 or 60 days or 45 or what. But anyway, I, I remember I had to do this quicker than that. So I was going to go to these five sites that they had all agreed I could go to, and that would be representative of uh, the whole five business units. And I would interview their top supervisors or people who had recently been a supervisor and moved up one level in the rankings. Um, and I would come back and do a readout of that. And I did that. I did the analysis. I came back and I had documented it in an analysis report. I distributed it and I started walking them through that and all hell broke loose. This is the only way to describe it to manufacturing people. All hell, Hades broke loose. And they were all screaming and yelling at me and all this stuff. And I remember this. We were in Toronto at a manufacturing site. Uh, I was dealing with my 30 customers, if you will. My boss's boss, Bill Wiggenhorn, was in the audience. The training manager for that site was in the audience and a couple people from his staff. And this was just, I'd lost total control from the podium uh, making my presentation, you know, with the overhead transparencies. You put it on the overhead projector, one slide or foil at a time and project this. And they were all screaming and yelling and all this stuff. And so... You know, I before the Navy, before my three years in the Navy, where I learned how to you know, talk Navy talk, some of you know what that means, I worked in construction. And so I worked in construction for nine summers in a row. And so there wasn't anything that I learned in the Navy that I hadn't already heard or learned in, in the construction world. So this is all going on. And there was probably a slight pause in the commotion going on between these 30 moms. And I said, you know, I can't work for 30 of you people. Why don't you pick the meanest son of a bitch amongst you and I'll work for that person? Gasps from 
my boss's boss, and actually I was skip level reporting at the time, but from the training folks, gasp, oh, well, the manufacturing operations manager, they love that kind of talk. They knew that. Oh. So I said, and, they, and you know, the funny part was they knew immediately who the meanest son of a bitch was in their group. A guy named Mike Weiss, who was in Franklin Park, Illinois, just down the road from the corporate headquarters, and so he was going to be able to keep tabs on me. I'd be able to check in with him. He'd keep me on the straight and narrow, you know, no baloney from the training organization. Let's get what we need and let's really control this young whippersnapper guy. Uh, I was probably 28 years old, 29 years old at the time. And uh, so I worked with Mike. We can finish the analysis up. Whatever they didn't like, I went and fixed. And then I came up with the design. I came up with this, what I started calling a training and development path. Part of a curriculum architecture design is I've got different audiences and I've got five people from five business sectors. So on the front end, what I call, what we late, what we now call onboarding before we get to ongoing development, onboarding development, ongoing development. It included, you know, here's your organization. Welcome to, you know, your strategic, welcome to Motorola. Welcome to your strategic business unit. Welcome to your site and facility. Welcome to your building sometimes. You know, here's where the emergency exits are and the eye wash and things like that. Um, and I built that and so my path had basically five paths built into one where I could show like Gary Rummler's uh, process maps with the work streams. I could show here's the things that are common across all five types of business in modular format. Here's where you would go and learn a welcome to Motorola. Everybody needed that. Well, welcome to your strategic business unit. Well, you know, one fifth or so of the audience needed each one of those. So there was five versions of that. And then we had 30 operations, uh, manufacturing operations managers, which meant we had 30 facilities. So there was 30 facility modules on there. You didn't need to learn about the others unless you were going to spend some time there, but you needed to know about yours. You needed to know where the exits were, what the procedures were, emergencies, security things, you know, how to get your badge, how to get badges for people, how to bring guests through, all that kind of stuff, which is part of the job of a supervisor. Well, anyway, so I'm showing this and, you know, no one understood it when I unveiled this big, long path, you know, flip chart pages taped together, post-it notes or whatever it was that we were using back then to, to show the modular content with names written on there and the estimated times for each on there and page count or hours or whatever and uh, again all hell broke loose but this time Mike Weiss stood up and said shut the you know what up and listen to the guy and that was everybody's signal that back off sit down listen up we've got this right according to Mike anyway and uh, this is what we're gonna do now we're here to show you what we're going to go do. We're not here to ask your permission or something like that is what he told them, which is a little bit controversial. But when you're the meanest SOB in the room, you can get by with that kind of stuff. So Mike Weiss became my champion. And one of the things I learned from that experience was that you need one on every critical project. You need somebody who's going to make the final decision or force the final decision so you're not held hanging and missing your deadlines because people can't make a darn decision. And so I always ask for that kind of a person uh, in my project as a consultant. Um, that was one of my big takeaways. Plus, speak in the language of the customer. If they don't like the term exemplar, boot it and get yourself a new term. What would they like to call it? And if they don't have, then you can propose different terms and one that works for them. Um, and make sense for them and makes them comfortable with that and one of the things you're doing is that you're showing you're on their side you're not there to fight them you're there to help them and what do they want to call it go with that so that's kind of my ramp up into the world of instructional systems design before I get into after I left Motorola I became a consultant in 1982 but uh, so those were some of the uh, my experiences and my lessons learned. Uh, uh, one thing not to forget is that uh, 
you know, I got to a chance to work on, I don't know, maybe a dozen projects with Gary Rumler. And, uh, you know, I was the training project supervisor at Motorola, and I had my consultant, Gary Rumler, or, you know, John Carlisle or somebody. And uh, uh, in the case of both <laughs> Gary Rumler and John Carlisle, they were really the experts. I was not. And so he was my consultant, which meant I carried his pencils around as we went from meeting to meeting, site to site, et cetera, et cetera. And so I got to spend a lot of quality time with Gary Rumler, and that's where I also met uh, Carol Panza, uh, who was working with Gary at the time, and I met Gary's son, Rick Rumler, who was also working with Gary at the time. And uh, one of the things, uh, one of my takeaways in, in, in working with the good doctor, Dr. Rumler, was that at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day, we were briefed and we were debriefed. And Gary was um, very kind and generous, and he would gently shape the behavior. If I would come back and report, you know, what I had done and how I had done it, what data I was bringing back, he would be kind to the rookie, uh, suggesting, you know, what I was going to be looking for. Now, I had learned a derivative of a derivative of the Rumler analysis methodology back at Wix Lumber. Um, we used a thing called, they called it a performance table at Praxis, at R R Rumler and Gilbert did, and we called it uh, a performance model. It's also known as a job model, but if you're looking at work, performance, that involves more than one job, it's kind of silly to call it a job model if there's four or five jobs represented in the thing, so I started calling it a performance model early on. And Gilbert had this concept called the knowledge map, and we turned that into the knowledge matrices and did that a little bit differently. But I started developing a set of categories of enabling knowledge and skills. I have 17 of them. And I use that to systematically derive the enabling knowledge and skills. So if I were to say, you know, the, the performance is represented by an ADDIE model, A-D-D-I-E, Analysis, Design, Development, Implementation, and Evaluation. And if we're looking at analysis, we could prescribe, you know, what are, or decide, derive what are the outputs produced in the analysis phase and then what are the tasks associated with each one of those outputs and what are the various roles and responsibilities in the production of that output who's performing these tasks and we can capture ideal performance and then on this very same page on the performance model we can identify so what's the current state gaps for those people who aren't master performers where are they missing the boat Let's look at the outputs and the measures that we've captured and where are we getting outputs from the non-master performers and what measures do they typically not meet? And that's how we got into what are the gaps? And then we could identify what are the probable gap causes. I mean, if we had all day and, a, and another week, we could uh, maybe get down to root causes, but I want off the top of my master performers' heads, why is Guy the rookie not a master performer? He's producing that analysis report, but it's, you know, it's complete, it's accurate, but it's late. And late ain't no good, as they used to say. And so everything is fine except for late. Well, then we could probe on, you know, so what's, what's the typical deficiency? It was being late, not on time. And what's the probable cause? Delays in approval, internal approval before it is finalized and ready to feed the design process downstream. So we could identify that, we could identify, and so one of the things that I learned is that you would ask master performers, you know, well, how do you avoid these barriers to performance? And even most importantly, what do you do if they're unavoidable? So they could give me their strategies and tactics for avoiding barriers in the first place, and what their strategies and tactics were for dealing with it if it was unavoidable. And these are things that I've been incorporating into training content because I don't want to teach somebody this is as easy as ABC or one, two, three. It's not usually. This is usually we're going after higher risk, higher reward kinds of performance, and it's usually complex or complicated. And we needed to teach people, yeah, the one, two, three, this is how it is simple. Now, you know, throw a monkey wrench into that. You know, how are you going to deal with that? Well, we need to teach people how to deal with the 
typical or the common or the most prevalent barriers that the performers would face. Building their confidence that when they got back to the real world, their job, back on the job, that they could be successful. And sometimes the, the trainees, the participants in our training courses, they knew what that real world was. They knew what some of those barriers were. So they were appreciative because they could recognize that it wasn't as simple as one, two, three, that there's all this other stuff that they had to contend with and that we were going to be able to train them on that as well. So that's what the performance model captures. You know, on one page, ideal performance, and on the other side of the page, here's the gap analysis, going through the A and the D and the next D or whatever the framework was that we would use. And I call those areas of performance. Be, could be called major duties or accomplishments, but I learned a long time ago that those labels have nuanced meanings to many people. Not commonly shared across the board, but rather than deal with those nuanced meanings, I'm creating a brand new term. Yeah, I'm part of the problem. Uh, as areas of performance, so I could define, well, what that is and what that isn't. And it would serve my purposes in this project and not, you know, people wouldn't be dragging in, well, you know, key results areas, you know, that's this and that, you know, no. So anyway, so I was able to frame the performance, identify the outputs, the tasks, the various roles and responsibilities of ideal performance. Because master performers are theoretically operating at an ideal level. It's doable. It's not theoretical. They're doing it. This is how they do it. But here's the gaps. We also need to train people on how to avoid the barriers in their work environments or what to do if it was unavoidable. But we take that performance data, and I put it all on flip charts when I gather this stuff in group meetings. We used a facilitated group process of master performers, other subject matter experts, sometimes supervisors, and sometimes novice performers would be part of our analysis team. And we'd go from identifying the performance and anchor everything we were going to do by, with that performance model so that's the end goal. That's the terminal objective is get people to be able to perform like that. However, there's a bunch of stuff you got to know in order to be able to do. To do that performance, you got to know a bunch of stuff. So again, I use 17 categories of enabling knowledge and skills, and I would systematically derive those enabling knowledge and skills. I could look at, uh, take the very first category, uh, um, uh, laws, regulations, and codes. And I could say, when you're doing that stuff in the A box, the analysis box, what laws, regulations, and codes must you comply with when you're doing those tasks? And then they would tell me, and I'd write that stuff down, and I'd say, okay, so what are the laws, regulations, and codes when you're doing that first D, design? And if there are some, we'll list those. And any of the ones that we listed for the A box, if they were, you also needed that knowledge, awareness or knowledge or skill, when you were doing both A and D, for example, using you know a word processing software or whatever, you use that everywhere, but it wasn't a law regulation code. But anyway, so we would systematically tease this out. It's a long, tedious process. We would take a knowledge and skill category and go across all areas of performance and pull all that out. While everybody's thinking about laws, regulations, and codes, let's look at the whole job and pull all that stuff out. And then we'd go to the next category, internal company policies and procedures. Well, if you're a highly regulated company, I learned, you don't need to cover the laws, regulations, and codes because they're already covered in the policies and procedures of a highly regulated company. So you could skip that knowledge and skill category and just focus on the internal policies and procedures and make sure that your training and the performance afterwards would square with that. And the other categories were what internal organizations you need to know about, what external organizations might you need to know about, uh, what so computer software uh, tools might you have to work with, uh, what interpersonal skills did you need, uh, what management and supervisory skills would you need. Of course, if your target audience aren't managers and supervisors, you can skip that category. So of the 17 categories, you don't often use all of them but there's been occasion when I have. Um, so we would have all this analysis data, performance data, enabling knowledge and skill data, and that would allow me to do my last part of my analysis. The first part is actually a target audience analysis, 
who's the target audience, who's the primary target audience, who's the secondary target audience, who's the tertiary target audience, which meant we're going to meet the needs fully of the primary target audience. On the secondary target audience, we may meet some of their needs, but if we don't get it all, that's fine. They're secondary. Tertiary is the label that I gave to target audiences that other people might be confused and assume we're addressing them, but we're not. And so we're going to be declarative. We're going to say, here's the tertiary audience. We don't care what they need. We're not addressing it at all. They can complain all they want. We really don't care because we're here to, in this project to meet the needs of the primary target audience. Some of that content that we're going to produce is going to spill over and be available to the secondary audience, but we don't care if it's everything that they need to do their job. And the tertiary audience, please don't hold us uh, to meeting their needs. So target audience analysis, performance analysis, knowledge and skill analysis, and then was the fourth part, and that is existing training assessments. So if the shareholder of the enterprise has, uh, through their shareholder equity, has invested unbeknownst to them, that some training organization and learning and development organization has taken some of that money and converted it into content, what can we reuse either as is or after modification? And what content might some people think we should be able to use, but we're going to declare that it's NA, not appropriate. So we could look at the inventory of content and try to salvage and reuse prior investments in training content. It's maddening to me that, that too often we, those of us in the business, create disposable content as if it's got no value at all. And we don't seem to appreciate that we're taking shareholder equity money and converting it into content and then throwing it away or organizing it or hiding in such places so that no one else can find it. We create the same content over and over and over again. Very inefficient, very poor type of practice. Um, but those were my four types of analysis. And one of the rules that I had, and I would tell my project steering teams this, is that I don't intend to collect any analysis data that I'm not going to use in the design phase. I'm either going to use that data to frame application exercises, practice with feedback, demonstrations, and the knowledge and or skills that you needed to make sense of the demonstration to follow. And that demonstration was to be just like the application exercise, practice and feedback that the participants or learners would go through. So we'd tell them, we'd show them, and then we'd make it, show them, show us back that you got it. And whether you wanted to consider the practice and feedback a test or a quiz, practice and feedback, you could use the very last practice and feedback session um, as a final test to see if everybody got it well enough to go back out on the job and begin to do the job and continue the learning out there with you know informal means or social means or however. Um, but so one of the things that I have about analysis is that I got I could never figure out people's task analysis, you know, random lists of tasks that, you know, have face validity. You show that to your customer, they're going to look at that and they're going to go, well, yeah, they got to do all that stuff. But what that was often missing was, where do those tasks lead to? Is there a worthy output, to borrow the phrase of Tom Gilbert, is there a worthy output produced? You know, what are the key measures or metrics of that output? How do we know a good one from a bad one is my simple question, the layman's question about that. And they can tell us, well, you know, it's got to be accurate, it's got to be complete, and it's got to be on time. And there may be other ways to articulate that too. And you, I just capture that from the voice of the master performers and let them guide the whole process. And then I would reassemble either a subset of the analysis team or the entire analysis team, but I had a rule that most of my clients, uh, you know, I could explain it to them. No new players. We're going to reform as a group, as a design team, and we're going to take that analysis data and we're going to create a design out of that. And if you send in somebody new that hasn't been part of the analysis data, they're going to waste all of our time by questioning all the analysis data. Well, where's this or where's that? Well, five pages later is the answer. Well, where's this next thing? Well, seven pages later. But if you hadn't been in the analysis meeting, you would slow us down and you would inhibit our progress and probably blow our deadline. We'd spend the amount of time we'd allocated for this and we wouldn't be done at the end of it because we'd put somebody new into the process. 
Well, that made sense to most of my clients. On occasion, they'd send somebody in here, and I'd have to have one of the other master performers read them the riot act to shut up and sit down and watch this. And at the end of the day, you can ask your questions, but not in the middle of the day because you're slowing us down. But I would take all that analysis data and form the design. And most of my work is on this curriculum architecture stuff where I'd be developing uh, training and development paths. And so the analysis data was kind of at a high level, a macro level. The design was at a macro level. And if the missing content, the gap content on the training and development path, because you could see we've got this one as is, we're going to use it as is. We've got another chunk of content, we're going to use that here, but we're going to have to modify it so it's not quite right. But, you know, we got a good jump start on it. And here's the stuff that we don't have at all. So the client could prioritize based on their understanding of what knowledge and skills would give them back in their work site, you know, so the managers and executives could decide, yeah, let's build this content here, this other content. Yeah, that's where it would go in the sequence. Yeah, that's what we would cover. And I don't have any burning desire to spend a nickel on that guy. And I said, well, good, we'll tag it. It's going to have a zero priority, which means it's not a priority of high, medium, or low. It's a zero, which is the signal to all of us in the future that we don't ever want to touch this. We will leave it to what Guy calls unstructured OJT, because there's a thing such as structured OJT, which is a viable uh, method you know, that coaches would use, structured OJT. But if there's things that we wouldn't even touch, we'll name it, and that's as far as we're going to go. That was unstructured OJT. And 20 years after I started all this stuff, it became known as informal learning. Um, and training and development paths, 20 some years later, became known as learning paths because our language all shifted from training to learning. Thanks to people who misunderstood Peter Senge in the fifth discipline, um, trying to become a learning organization. And almost all of my clients changed their names from training organization of some sort to learning organization of some sort, learning and development. Um, a total misread of that book and what it was trying to convey in my opinion but that's what happened and so our language went from training to learning you know and we say ridiculous things like uh, training well you know we train dogs and my retort to that depending on the context where I'm in is that uh, don't tell that to the Marines I'll have a little rip your head off <clears throat> anyway so um, those were some of my important lessons early on in my career I was very lucky to be exposed to the work of Rumler and Gilbert and Harless and Mager and taking from the best of those things. I was uh, so lucky to have gone to work at Motorola where I got to work with Gary Rumler and Neil Rackham and John Carlisle and meet Ray Svensson uh, because after 18 months at Motorola I decided it was time for me to move on. I wasn't getting along with uh, my boss. I had spent the first nine months skip level reporting to Bill Wiggenhorn. Then nine months into it, I got a boss who micromanaged me in Chicago all the way from Phoenix, Arizona. And it was a not fun experience. And I asked to be uh, moved to some other part of the organization and that didn't happen. And uh, my wife came home from work one day, she had been, uh, uh, Bill Wiggenhorn had linked her up with Ray Svensson, and so she had gone to work for this Ray Svensson, who taught me all about curriculum architecture design. Um, during the summer of 1982, the two of them, Ray Svensson and, and Karen, my wife, came to me and said, uh, we saw what you did with that Motorola supervisor thing and creating the, that training path. Uh, could you do that with this project that they had undertaken with uh, Exxon Exploration USA geologists and geophysicists exploring for oils in you know the the sands of West Texas, the Rocky Mountains, the tundra of Alaska, or offshore? You know that's where we find our oil. And uh, they said, could you spend some time, you know, taking our analysis data and creating your training and development path, your curriculum architecture. And so I spent two weekends, uh, lots of hours uh, you know, over those four days, creating this training and development path, which was uh, very well received by their client down in Houston, Texas. Um, 
And when she came home one day and said, we're thinking about uh, bringing on the, uh, a new person, a new consultant to join us because our business is expanding. And I said, I want that job. And she said, oh, I already told Ray that you wouldn't take it because you're doing all this work on these projects with Geary Rumler. And so you weren't going to leave. And I guess she hadn't picked up well enough about uh, how I was feeling about my current uh, direct report, uh, my boss. Um, and that I really needed to leave. And so I left Motorola after 18 months and joined Ray Svensson in his consulting practice. And they hired me the same day they brought on a new, uh, basically, secretary. Um, and so there were uh, then three consultants and two secretaries, and then we grew the business from there. But that's the story for another video. Thank you for allowing me to share all that with you.